Hi there, folks. My name is Elliot Kimmel, and I'm a high school teacher in London, Ontario. And this is my video tutorial for chromatography for photosynthesis. This is recommended for students in grade 12 biology in the photosynthesis strand. Instructions for using the video tutorial. Well, the purpose is to prepare students to perform the chromatography lab, uh, covering some of the theory that's involved with it so that we can save a little bit of class time and they come, a, come with some knowledge ahead of time. Um, when you see the image of the quill up here in the ink, that's going to be an indication to uh, take some notes and to draw the diagrams. So let's talk about methods of separation, some of the uh, things that I'm sure you've seen before. If you've ever uh, cooked spaghetti, you know that you've got to strain the water out. So this is a, a physical method of separation. Here's another physical method of separation if you were lucky enough to be panning for gold and actually getting some. And here are some kids filtering a solution. Everybody's done that in elementary school. All of these things can be used to separate substances. But how are we going to go about separating the photosynthetic pigments in spinach? And that's the leaf that we're going to be using for this chromatography experiment. First of all, let's talk about some of the pigments that are found in spinach leaves. The predominant one is going to be chlorophyll. There's an abundance of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, and here is the chemical structure. And we've studied already in class the porphyrin ring or the porphyrin head up here and the phytol tail, the hydrophobic part down here and the um, hydrophilic or polar part up here. Um, there are other pigments as well. There are carotenoids, such as beta-carotene and xanthophils, and here's the structure of that. Again, um, a very non-polar structure, uh, but with similar alternating single and double bonds used in the light reactions of photosynthesis. So we have a number of pigments in there, not all of them mixed together, and the idea is we want to separate them out somehow. And this is where chromatography comes in. Um, You've all seen the capillary action of a paper towel, the way it picks up water and, and water can sort of travel up a paper towel. Well, we're going to be using chromatography paper, which does the same thing. It's got cellulose in it and it will draw liquid along it. And that's what we're going to use as our chromatography paper. Recall doing this experiment in elementary school, taking a, some black ink and putting it in water and having it separate into the different colors. Black ink from a marker can be spotted on. This is the term that we use, sort of spotting a chemical onto the chromatography paper. And the place at which you spot it on, that's called the origin. The paper is going to be dipped into a solution of some sort or a solvent, a liquid, that's going to pull the pigment up, pull the ink up. All right, the solvent is going to be the mobile phase here, and it's going to pull the ink up. And as you can see, it's starting to separate out into the different colors here. So the different colors of ink will be separated and the colors that are the most soluble in the solvent, in this case the solvent would ha happen to be water, but the colors most soluble will travel the fastest and the further up. So uh, in this case this blue color is the most soluble in the solvent and the, the pinkish color or purple down here is the least soluble. Once again the mobile phase is the solvent and the stationary phase is the chromatography paper. So let's specifically talk now about chromatography of the photosynthetic pigments. So I've got an illustration here of a chromatogram. That means a piece of chromatography paper. It's cut into a V like this and it's dipped into the solvent. The solvent would be right down there. The photosynthetic pigments can of course be separated by this technique, paper chromatography. And the separation is going to be based on each pigment's solubility in the solvent, which will travel up the chromatography paper. So this shows the direction of the solvent flow. It will be moving from here, and it will be attaching to the chromatography paper and moving up. And as it moves up, it's going to carry with it various pigments, which will go to different heights. The more soluble the pigment is in the solvent, the further up the paper it will travel. So in this case, this pigment spot here is the one that was the most soluble and it traveled the furthest. This is the least soluble in the solvent and traveled the least distance. So the most soluble pigment is the one that is nonpolar. This is assuming that the solvent that we're using is nonpolar and because of that principle that like dissolves like, 
nonpolar substances will travel the farthest with a nonpolar solvent. Um, think of it like like they like each other or they enjoy each other's company or they're attracted to each other. So the nonpolar substance will travel the farthest with the nonpolar solvent. And the least soluble substance will be the polar one. It doesn't react well with, with the solvent, so it leaves the, sol the solvent faster. And like I said, usually the solvent is nonpolar, so the nonpolar pigment will travel the fastest and, and hence the furthest. We can do some calculations uh, with chromatography and we'll calculate something called the RF or the retention factor. So once again, what we do is we spot the pigments from the mixture, from the leaf, so it's got all the photosynthetic pigments in there. We're going to put them all and we're going to spot them on the paper at a spot called the origin. So here I've drawn the origin and this is a mixture of all the pigments so we can't see our chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B or carotenoids or anything. They're all together in the mixture. We're going to dip the chromatography paper into the solvent making sure that the origin does not touch the solvent, right? We want the solvent to sort of move its way up and then hit the origin. And the pigments will separate. As you can see, I'm drawing them there. There's a yellow one, a blue one, and a red one. So these are the different pigment spots that were separated from the, from the origin there, from the mixture, as the solvent was pulled up. What we do then is we stop the experiment when the solvent is near the top of the chromatography paper. And this is going to be called the solvent front. And from here, we can do some calculations. So I've labeled the origin. I put an O there. This is pigment A, B, and C, just for reference. And of course, this was our solvent front. So immediately after the experiment is done, immediately when the, when the solvent front gets near the top of the paper, you stop it and quickly mark the spots because they're going to dry in the air and they may fade a little bit. So here I've circled the origin and the three pigments and I've marked where the solvent front is. And it doesn't have to be circled like this. It can be any way that you can mark the exact location of those on the chromatography paper. Then you're going to take a ruler and you're going to measure some distances. The first one we want is the distance from the middle of a pigment spot to the origin. So this distance right here is P, from the middle of the origin to the middle of the pigment spot. We also want to measure the distance from the origin to where the solvent front was, and I'm calling that S. We can then calculate something called the retention factor. And the way we do that is we say RF, or retention factor, for pigment A is going to be equal to the pigment distance divided by the solvent distance. And in this example, the pigment distance was 2, so from 0 to 2, and it doesn't matter what units, inches, millimeters, centimeters, because the units are going to cancel. So the pigment distance here was 2, and the solvent distance was from the origin up to the solvent front. So it's going to be that distance. Well, that wasn't very nicely drawn, but uh, you know what I mean. All right, so when you divide those, you get a factor of 0 0.28, and they're going to be decimal, decimal numbers. So let's now calculate the RF for pigment B. The pigment distance over the solvent distance, in this case, Pigment B went up 4 units compared to the 7 units for the solvent, and that gives us a bigger number. So note, this is a bigger number because, because pigment B went up a higher distance than pigment A. Some uses of chromatography. Um, they, chromatography can be used to identify various chemicals based on knowing something about uh, the chemical structure and the solubility. So for example, here are two molecules that you may be familiar with. This benzene ring, which is a hydrocarbon, it's very um, nonpolar. And here is benzoic acid, and the only difference here is that this one has a carboxyl group, right? Now a carboxyl group is a polar group, so this molecule is more, more po polar, sorry, benzoic acid is more polar than benzene. So which one of these is which? That's what we want to solve. Well, we can tell that this one is benzene and this one is benzoic acid because if the solvent is nonpolar 
and benzene is nonpolar, it's going to be the one that is going to travel the furthest. Benzoic acid, on the other hand, is polar, and so it won't go as far up with a nonpolar solvent. So you can use this technique to identify some chemicals. Um, in terms of performing the actual lab, you'll get specific instructions because you'll be getting leaves and you'll be crushing them and using acetone and petroleum ether and stuff like that um, and then spotting your mixture. So there's, there's various uh, chemicals and pieces of equipment that you'll need to use to do this. But this video was just really about getting the theory behind it. But it's interesting because you can use paper chromatography on a number of substances. In addition to that black ink, you can try these red leaves, purple leaves, yellow leaves, and you'll get different separations and different sort of uh, quantities of each pigment. So that's the end of the presentation itself, a short little video there. Um, hopefully you'll be prepared now for the pre-lab and performing the experiment itself. Keep in mind that the chemicals used in chromatography can be dangerous. Uh, they may be flammable or hazardous, so wear your safety glasses, tie back your long hair, certainly don't have any open, open flames, and, and watch your loose clothing, and observe all appropriate safety protocols so that you have a successful and enjoyable lab experience. All right, so I hope that helped. See you later. Try to get my